going to go ahead and get started if everyone can just find a seat. It's pretty easy to. So good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this year's Michael R. Hoadley Excellence in Instructional Technology Award presentation. Now each year we come together to celebrate a faculty member who has demonstrated excellence in instructional technology. Now you're going to notice something, that the presentations that you're normally used to with a traditional PowerPoint, it's a little bit different this year. If you look at the screen here, you, you see the nice traditional slide, but you'll notice that every word I say is going to be transcribed right below. And that's because I, wanted to do, I decided to do something a little bit different this year and kind of give you the experience that our students see in online classrooms. So what you're seeing is a program called Blackboard Collaborate. Now this is where we host real-time lectures with students online. In addition to being able to video chat and present to our students in real time, I'm also demonstrating our ability to now live caption our words. So somewhere across the country, a transcriptionist is typing everything I'm saying verbatim. Now they've seen a script, but basically what's going to happen is if I make a mistake, they're actually going to type my mistake so there's proof that maybe I'm not infallible. So as you watch the screen, we're attempting to simulate what a student experiences in an online lecture and to demonstrate how this technology is used on our campus. With that said, I'd like to take a few minutes to recognize the achievements at the Center for Academic Technology support this year. The CATS multimedia team has been hard at work continuing with media support, primarily in academics. Now, our multimedia team provides assistance in traditional and online classrooms, specifically with filming and encoding. Also, we stream video through Kaltura, and we offer captioning services. This past year, the CATS multimedia team has also completed grant-based projects for the Illinois Principals Association and the Illinois Higher Education Center. Now the IPA project, Classroom Voices, highlighted the implementation of core curriculum in the state of Illinois, while the IHEC project focused on motivational interventions for college students on alcohol consumption. Other notable projects include the annual Bridging Voices of Our Community, the It's On Us campaign, EIU Is, a look at EIU and the broader community, the documenting of the Whiteside Garden, Cats on Campus, and collaborating with Cameron Craig in geology and geography on his expedition trips. I'd like to show you a sample of what the multimedia team does, and this video was recently screened at the Board of Trustees meeting. Hey. Hey, EIU. Hey, EIU. It's time we talked. Talked about something important. We've already heard about these incidents. They're happening all around us. Our fellow students being sexually assaulted. Our fellow students are being sexually assaulted. In places we walk through every day. Every day. This is real. This is real. And it's on, it's on our, our campus. campus. That's why we all need to pledge. It's on us. It's on us. It's on us. All of us. To help end this. To create an environment where sexual assault is unacceptable. The It's On Us campaign is nationwide. And aspires to help keep men and women safe from sexual assault. Because this isn't just a women's issue. It's an issue that affects everyone. We are joining this campaign. To aspire to change at EIU. It's not just about the student athletes. Or the Greek community. Or even just the faculty and staff. And it's not about the different student organizations. So join us this year. In changing the culture around our campus, because you chose to be an EIU Panther. You chose to be part of this community. And in this community, we stick up for each other. It's, it's on, on us. us. It's on us to help end this. In addition to our multimedia team, our staff at the Gregg Technology Center has also been busy making improvements to our campus community and our campus computing environments. This past year, the staff at the Gregg Technology Center has <clears throat> improved the implementation of automatically updating the Windows and Mac computers in our classroom instructional spaces, and they also released an update for the student technology checkout system. In addition, the staff expanded their role 
in serving FCS, military science, and the School of Technology. They also completed the solid state upgrade project in order to extend the life of classroom and instructional machines and were able to update all of the Windows technology enhanced classrooms to solid state newer technology storage. Finally, the staff also worked with ITS in replacing the aging semantic antivirus with the Sophos antivirus system for all of our operating systems across campus. Another important area of CATS, and it's seen more and more um, faculty visiting, is the Center for Online Technology support and the Center for Online Learning. Now, the mission of the Center for Online Learning is to provide training, support, and services for faculty teaching and students taking online or technology-enhanced classes and to assist the university in ensuring the quality of online instruction here at EIU. The Center for Online Learning has continued to meet this challenge and continues to increase as EIU continues to increase its online course offerings. Over the past year, our web office has also been busy. Now, our web, our web office team is a tremendous resource for our campus community as they are responsible for EIU's virtual presence and the development of web applications. Their skill and talent have garnered EIU a reputation among other university web development teams as their virtual presence often rivals that of larger institutions such as Harvard, Northwestern, and the University of Illinois and Auburn. From videography to customer relations management platforms, the web office is consistently recognized for their outstanding content and development. This past year, for example, in January of 2015, we won the best annual report category in both judge and people's choice from Edgestyle for our annual report. In June of 2015, Michael Babcock's video, An Appetite for Change, wins the gold award as the top entry in news and research videography category for the Council of Advancement and Supportment Support of Education Circle of Excellence Award. Now this category featured over 47 videos and beat out submissions from the likes of Harvard, Brigham Young, and the University of California, Davis. In fall of 20, 2015, we released the new EIU website, the redesign. Now, as this page went live, we see that it's more mobile friendly and also it increased speed. Key improvements, again, made this site more mobile friendly. And now our work has begun on moving and transitioning all of our departments to this new mobile template. Additionally, we've developed and deployed 10 online graduate programs into the My EIU platform, and this allows students to not only apply online, but allows recruiters to better recruit new graduate students. And furthermore, we've integrated text messaging and a fully featured auto dialer system into the My, My EIU platform. Now, the auto dialer saves EIU money and it improves efficiency as, allow, as it allows our recruitment staff to log calls manually and make more calls per hour. Now, the next video I'd like to show you is the one from Michael Babcock, An Appetite for Change, that's won in a national award. And, of course, technology is not perfect, so we may or may not see that. Well, it looks like YouTube's not going to cooperate, so we're just going to move on. But it is a great video, and it did win an award. So if you have the opportunity to check it out, it's on the EIU 360 as well as on our YouTube channels. In addition to our different divisions within CATS, we also conduct a great deal of research across our campus community. Now, in 2015, we continued our collaboration with Educause, and we had in our undergraduate and faculty technology study, we had 1,025 undergraduate students participate as well as 167 faculty participants. A couple of the things that we learned were both students and faculty have a high interest in using mobile devices across campus to enhance learning. We also see that students strongly support the use of institutional data to customize their learning experience. And I thought about this as I was writing this speech and, and a customized learning experience. So if you think about every time that you log into Amazon, it tells you and makes suggestions for the things you want to buy. So using that data in the same way as we, we can reconceptualize education, if we can use data to give a student a customized learning experience by making suggestions on classes they can succeed in, classes that will help us gain retention, that's a great step in the use of our technology and our data across campus. 
We also see, we also have evidence that although our students are extremely technology savvy, they're not really achieving their full potential in the use of technology. So that's an area for improvement that we can work on across campus. Now with all of these accomplishments, it really wouldn't be possible without the support from the Office of the President and Office of the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce to you EIU's President, Dr. David Glassman. No, you didn't write me any notes. <laughs> now, it's, it's, it's great to be here, and it's great to uh, recognize uh, faculty members for the, for the wonderful work that, uh, that they're doing. Uh, I wish I could set, have seen the video that was uh, given the award, but uh, I imagine that'll come up uh, pretty soon. But uh, uh, it certainly is my pleasure to welcome everybody here today uh, for, this, for this event. Uh, I kept watching the words. I don't know, and, I, and now I'm watching to see if it's pulling up my words, but uh, yeah, it's freaking me out. <laughs> you know, I, I was listening to Clinton, but kind of. I was just watching the words go by. It, it was, I was mesmerized by it. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, I've had the luxury uh, of my age to see the change of instructional technology go through many, many phases during my 36-year career. Uh, to me, when I started as a, as a faculty member, and even before I did my dissertation using computer cards and writing my dissertation on a, on a typewriter, uh, and that was considered pretty high tech uh, at that time, uh, in the classroom, teaching technology was chalk and a, and a blackboard uh, and a couple of uh, picture books that you would hold up or you'd pull down a map from the wall, and that was, that was it. We had uh, extension teaching at that time, but it was all done by sending out the technology was stamps and books you sent out to do correspondence classes. So uh, classroom education outside of the university has been taking place for a long time. But the revolution, you know, really got started uh, when, when computer software uh, and video processing took place and revolutionized how we teach, and the pedagogy that we use. And I'm not sure, and I try to recall, if not recall, I try to understand, did we cause the change in student learning because of the technological changes that we were developing, or did we develop the technological changes in order to catch up with the way that students learn? Because it's very different, as anybody who's in the classroom knows, the old style of giving a lecture for 50 minutes is really impractical to just do that because you lose students' attention. They want to see, they want to visualize. I remember teaching physical anthropology and I'd be talking about mitosis and I would want to show them how mitosis works. So I have my chalk and here's my cell and then I draw two lines and I have another two cells and then I do another and I've got four cells and then I put on a little sperm tail and you know, there, there you go. But now with video and you're seeing it in live, action in real time, it is so much more different. And students are equated to being very visual learners as opposed to auditory learners that they were in, in my generation of teaching. You learned by what you heard, not by what you saw or by what you experienced in many, many cases. And that's changed. And technology has changed so greatly now where you have classroom management systems. Uh, I started with Blackboard and then it was Sakai and now we have D2L here and, and so on, as well as video representations in our classrooms. Students learning online, the regular material and knowledge-based material that we used to teach in the classroom and then coming to class for flip classes where you can then get into major dialogue and discussion and debate, it, it's incredible. But technology and student learning have kept going abreast of each other. And they will change into the future. I don't know what it'll be. I probably won't see much more. But it's just been an incredible journey for me. And I have always, and this is the tie-in, I have always admired those innovators who were the first people in the classroom to try something, to experiment with technology to test things out to see if students react to it in a positive fashion. 
and that classroom outcomes were being seen at higher accountability through the activities and technology that professors were using. I'm always admired by that. And those of you who are being honored today, I know there'll only be one person who is selected, but I read the bios of all four, and when I read them, it's just really encouraging, you, encouraging to me because you are those people that I have so admired my entire career. Because relative to teaching technology, I have always been a follower and a slow one. Okay. PowerPoint, yeah, after a while, after it was, you know, everybody accepted it. Something else, yeah, then I would migrate to it. And occasionally I would slip into 50 minute lectures and be told by the students, you know, where is the technology? You're probably thinking that right now. So I'm gonna sit down so that we can get further in this, uh, uh, in this event. But I do want to tell all four of you who have been nominated for this, you have my respect and you have my gratitude and you have my thanks for what you're doing to make teaching more powerful for the students that we have at Eastern Illinois University. And I thank you very much for that. Thank you, Dr. Glassman. One of the things that's it's kind of fun is you started your teaching or your career 36 years ago, so that was three years before I was born. <laughs> and I can say, now, now here's a little bit about me, is, is I've talked about this last year, is I'm a, what you'd call a non-traditional student. So I came here in, in 2000 and I left in 2000 and I came back in 2011. And during that time, the, uh, the innovation changed, or the, the classrooms changed, our blackboards were are no longer blackboards, they're now smart boards. They, we had projectors in our classroom attached to the ceiling. It was no, no longer the, the overhead and the, the slides with the vis-a-vis the -vis markers. So in the 11 years that I've, between when I started and restarted and then and now finished, it's a little bit, you know, a great deal has changed. So I expect um, during your tenure here and, and elsewhere, Dr. Glassman, that things will, will continue to rapidly change. But also, I wanted to say that uh, I know that many of you were interested in looking at the words on screen. So I'm a, I did my undergraduate as in communication studies, and also my master's is in, is in comm studies. And now, um, this is a new experience for me. So I'm trained to do public speaking, you know, in theory. Um, but this is a little bit different for me. You know, I also find myself getting distracted, but, but I digress. So. Um, so thank you, Dr. Glassman, for your stories. But I'd also like to take the time to uh, thank our provost and vice president for academic affairs, Blair Lord, for his continued support. And we're going to hear a word from him now. So, Dr. Lord. Clinton, frighteningly, I started even more years ago than Dr. Glassman did, a number of years, more than three before you were born. Um, I, too, want to welcome everybody to this uh, annual event. It's important to remember, uh, especially in these very difficult times, that we have a lot to celebrate, and we need to take time to remember to do that. Um, when I arrived at Eastern 14 um, years ago, seven or eight months ago, almost 15 years ago, our technology initiative, it was called CATS, but it was under the leadership of Mr. Technology Robert Augustine, and he'll be the first to admit that he was not Mr. Technology. Uh, he only got a smartphone about three years ago. And I can make fun of myself because I still don't have one. Um, flip phone that, that I have. In fact, uh, Dr. Stowell, one of the recipients in a prior year, was doing a demonstration of how he was using the re response technologies uh, to have the entire group participate with him. And uh, he had to make fun of the fact that I didn't have a device that could respond, so I never got a response into that. As Dr. Glassman says, uh, I came up when overheads were the big deal um, prior to PowerPoint, and uh, my dissertation was done on a typewriter as well. Uh, it was advanced, I think we both agreed, because it was electric typewriters at the time and not a manual typewriter, although I learned to type on a manual typewriter. 
Um, we have had astonishing development of technology here. Eastern, frankly, at this point, I believe, actually is a leader in how we engage technology effectively into compelling educational experiences for our students in the classroom. The work of CATS in collaboration with ITS have certainly been instrumental in this in uh, the years uh, that we've been working together on this. Yeah, so I want to thank all of the individuals that we've recognized over the years. Not quite sure how many years this has been going on. John is about 10 or 11, something on that order. So we've, been, we've had many, many people recognized. And those are the only, only the ones recognized. Many, many other faculty have engaged in having technology effectively a part of the educational experience. And I thank all of you, those we've recognized and those we haven't, for helping to make our educational experiences truly compelling with the creative engagement of technology. So with that, Clinton, I'll turn it back to you and thank everyone, and especially the nominees and recipients. Thank you, Dr. Lord. Um, one of the things that Dr. Lord mentioned was he still had a flip phone. Now, I know that times are tough and the budget's hard, but a flip phone, come on now. Um, the other thing that Dr. Lord mentioned, and, and I kind of wanted to just mention to you, was we do have a lot to celebrate. I was just, Dr. Cross is uh, one of my instructors this semester, and I was just telling him I got some great news. So, so it's my last semester here at Eastern, uh, my master's, but I found out on Friday that I was accepted to Purdue for full funding. And I, thank you, for my PhD. Yeah. So one of the things, I went through a phone interview with them and, and they were talking because of course they, they saw my Vita and everything like that and they had questions for me about my experience working in CATS and the technology experience that I had and, and the thing was with the, the coordinator and the, the selection committee, they asked, well you can do that and I said, well yeah, that's something I learned at you know, Eastern, something I learned, something I can do. So we do have a lot to celebrate because the educators here, um, in my experience at CATS, that's what's prepared me to go on prepared me to go on into a, a, a role to, to learn to be a faculty member to work on my PhD. So it's not just the folks in this room, but the folks you know, who, who I had for my undergraduate and all the folks who really work every day tirelessly and without a state budget to really improve the lives um, of our students. So it is a lot to celebrate. So uh, congratulations to them. Um, at this time, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Rigoberto uh, Chinchilla. He was last year's uh, Michael R. Hoadley Excellence in the Use of Technology Award recipient, and he is going to give us a demonstration on his uh, use of the, um, the use of, uh, or how he used his funding. So, Dr. Chinchilla. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I just want to say that um, one of the things that I like uh, at Eastern is that I've been able to have kind of crazy ideas and try to implement those ideas uh, just with the aim of, you know, do something new or improve something or helping students to do their work easily and more comfortable. And one of the original ideas was, well, I have this, uh, I have this lab. it's not possible, then I, I don't know. Maybe I would say that it's possible. So I, I done the work about three years ago, and we tried to do, did a thesis and, and on this. And the thesis kind of uh, 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 started the kind of the theoretical uh, foundation. <clears throat> so 
we have present, we don't want. How can we facilitate the students to go to the lab without them to be present in, actually in the lab? Uh, okay, so we begin to research and research and talk with other professors. We went to uh, University of Illinois to see if they have something like that. We didn't translate them, didn't. We went to Northern Illinois, they didn't have anything like that. So sometimes you get, well, if translate doesn't have it, maybe it's not possible. And I said, no, I, I, I still refuse the idea. Even if, if a big university doesn't have it, maybe we can have it. Even, even uh, you know, so I say, yes, we can. So uh, basically, the solution is implemented already. And uh, at this point, uh, my students can, uh, from anywhere in the world, even if a student is in China or Nigeria, they can actually enter the lab and program the, the, the lab equipment. Not, not simulators, but the real lab. So <clears throat> there is already a course that is conducted in, in that fashion. Uh, it's called uh, Advanced Telecommunications, and it better be advanced to do that. Uh, and some practices, some practices of cybersecurity have been, uh, this is another course I teach, have been migrated to also to that system. Um, so what we did is we used uh, cloud computing uh, combined with uh, a traditional telecom access Basically, a student has to download a little software that I just download here. Uh, it takes like about five minutes, probably or less. And from with that software in a solid connection to internet, they can go from anywhere in the world and enter the lab. And the advantage of this is that the lab is open 24-7. I can just log the lab and all the students are in the lab working from their homes. There, there is no need more for them to, to be present in the lab. So um, they have uh, access, when access is granted, uh, then uh, the user is assigned a random virtual computer from a pool of, of computers, and they log in to the virtual computer, and then they have access to this, uh, to what is called a simulator, but they also can have access to the real equipment. And the reason we do that is uh, we don't want them to, to give them access to, for the first time to the real equipment. We make them to practice in simulators, okay? And those simulators are exactly the same as the real equipment. The, 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 the paradox here is that the students, in some point, doesn't know if it's working in the real equipment <laughs> or it's working in the simulators because the experience is the same. So, <clears throat> Uh, after they have practice on the simulators, they go to the real equipment, okay? Uh, we want them to be proficient in, in, in the equipment. And we have created secure uh, firewalls and proxies, so uh, we, we are protected. And students are allowed to manage and program real switches, real routers, real equipment. They can move around the lab. Um, and this is not just access to the lab, but we have to to reorganize the lab in that way that that is possible. Uh, so the remote, remote facilities can be uh, uh, rich. So in, in a few words, this was a kind of a long project because um, what basically the first thing I need is just to re, re, redo the lab internally. So this can be happened. Then uh, it was necessary to create the infrastructure so any student at Eastern uh, taking these courses can get from anywhere in the world in, onto the lab, into the lab. And then I had to use cloud computing and, and VMware, uh, which is a form of cloud computing. So the students can have as, as many computers as they want, they can, uh, uh, at this point, is it possible for us give virtual computers to all the, uh, to whatever number of students we have? And then uh, we have to buy some licenses so they can practice in simulators as if they were in the real equipment. 
And the most challenging part with the adaptation of the academic uh, materials, because it's not the same to create lab guidelines when the students are, you are in front of the student in the lab with the equipment in front. Imagine now the student has to do it from their dorm. So how to create those guidelines, academically speaking, is a huge challenge. So the student can have the, the experience of working with the real uh, equipment. And um, this kind of uh, illustrates pretty much, um, this represents the student. So uh, they come uh, to the internet through a router. Uh, this goes to a firewall. It goes to a distribution, distribution switch. And through fiber optics, they finally reach our lab. And they can move around all the equipment in the lab and do their practices. Now, this is not an easy task to do in the sense that uh, many of this infrastructure is not under our control. So the, the thing that is uh, I'm more proud of, of this project is the collaboration I got from different units from the university. For example, Katz and John Henderson, uh, they donated the software for the simulators. Uh, thank you, John, for that. Uh, thank you to Katz to participate. So it was a collaborati collaborative effort. It's not just an island, but many units of the university we were in endless meetings. Uh, I went to ITS, I went to Katz, I went to different people in order to do this. So sometimes I think the academic units are too isolated uh, from all the resources we have around the university that we can use. Uh, the ITS personnel did all the technical routing and switching to put this project uh, in line. All that infrastructure was programmed, was allowed, uh, allowed me to do this project, and the ITS people was so kind, so uh, wor wor uh, hard work, it was a hard work from them to allow us to do this. Then we have to do many, many meetings with them. Then uh, Mr. Thomas McMullen um, facilitate all the cloud computing uh, being web programming so the students can have the, the experience on the virtual computers and from the virtual computers, which is a concept interesting, from the virtual computer they can go to the real equipment. Uh, my former GA, Jindamola Idobu, who um, uh, gave the, the, her thesis, her thesis uh, gave the foundation, the theoretical conceptualization of this project. Uh, <clears throat> she is in charge now of the old Waukegan County uh, telecommunications uh, equipment in, here uh, uh, in Chicago. Uh, and also um, my former chair, Deborah Woodley, who says, uh, say, well, you're crazy, we cannot do this. I mean, it has to, too many people has to collaborate with this, and then we did it anyway. And our current chair also that uh, helped us with the connections with John Henderson for, for the licenses. And my current GA that has been working on the, all the academic, uh, of adapt all the lab guidelines so that our students can do it from home. So this is a, a, a triumph of collaboration. That's what I would call it, and that's what I'm most proud of. So many, many units around the university with different capabilities helping professors to do these kind of things. Uh, I have another crazy project in mind, but I better wait to tell you this in a couple of years. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is what, uh, what we do. Um, can you help me to switch? I will try to demonstrate how to connect to my lab from here. Um, Okay, so this is what a student sees when, when they create an account. And again, they can be anywhere in the world, they just need an internet connection. And they see the name of the course, and when they uh, click, what happens is a virtual computer is created for a student. And from the virtual computer, they have what is called, the first thing we do is, uh, 
we uh, teach them how to work in a simulator. And the, the, the beauty of this is the equipment that the simulator has the same exact features of the real equipment. So for example, they can, um, they can now build uh, any network they, they need to build. And they can do literally thousands of experiments and they can program the equipment They can program the equipment pretty much from anywhere, but this is just a simulator. And then once they are proficient with the simulator, say, okay, maybe it's time for you to go uh, to the real equipment, okay? And what we have to do is uh, from here, Here it is. Right now, what you see right now is a real router, which is in my lab. And, and uh, at this point, I can begin to program that router. Uh, and from this router, they can move to other equipment around the, the lab and be inside pretty much the equipment I decide. So as you, as you may see, the, the challenge of do the, the lab guidelines for this is a huge challenge because typically when you conduct a lab, you assume someone will be on top of the students and someone will be directing them, move this, disconnect that, program that. At this point, um, we have created this. It's, this is something, as I told you, that uh, is innovative. I think it's the first time he has done, not just uh, pretty much, I can say, in Illinois. Um, I don't think any other university has this capability. And what, what we can do at this point is, as I can reach any equipment in my lab, other professors can, if they have microscopes or they have any you know chromatography equipment as far as that equipment has an IP address by replicating this project it is it, it is possible to reach the, that equipment in your labs and that creates a whole different mechanics of you know availability for the labs because now you don't, you don't need the students present there. They can do, if not all the experiments, they can do many experiments from home. And the lab is utilized properly, uh, uh, better, more efficiently, because uh, it's, it's, it's practically, a uh, student can do this at 2 a.m. or 6 a.m., whatever you know, time they want to enter the lab. They can program the equipment. And um, uh, this is what I did. It, it took about three years to do this, and it probably my next project would take another couple of years. <laughs> I've been working for a year now in, in, in another crazy project, but uh, this is, uh, I think this improves the way we serve our students. That's, that's the main thing. It, it, it gives them more options. It gives them, it, it gives them freedom to do these labs from anywhere, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a very good, um, uh, a very good feeling or technology department is exploding with students. We probably will need more licenses this, of this because we have, right now, uh, this, this lab was planned for about 17, 18 students. I have 50 now uh, taking this course remotely. And, um, and this course is online completely because to be completely online, I have to move the labs uh, to do it online. Well. I think I overdo my time here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Chinchilla. All right, so this year we have a great deal of award nominees that we'd like to recognize. And I know several nominees have teaching commitments, so they're not actually here. So 
we'll give them a round of applause anyway. If they are here, please stand. Our first is Wafiq Wabi from the School of Technology. As a leading engineering and technology ed educator, Dr. Wabi has employed innovative practices with cutting edge apps and animation software to greatly contribute to engineering technology education here on EIU's campus. Because of his influence, Dr. Wabi has also extended his educational services to stakeholders locally, nationally, and internationally via our capabilities to video stream. His main motive in, is to promote the evolution of technology and to provide an interactive, engaging experience for his students. Dr. Wabi ex aspires to extend ongoing projects and innovate new research projects to engage the academic community. So that's Dr. Wafi Wakib from the School of Technology. Our next nominee is Dr. Patricia Belleville from the Department of Art. Dr. Belleville has spent countless hours and work and dedication solely on cultivating a new and online hybrid master's program in art, art education, and community art. She began the arduous task of developing and designing a more technology-driven art program to strengthen the development of individuals interested in art education. As a result, Dr. Belleville created a program that not only catered to the development of artistic skill, but also to refine studio art technical skills through the use of Photoshop, InDesign, and professional art development. Our next nominee is Dr. Keisha Coker from the School of Business. Dr. Coker, through her methodical framework for her social media marketing class, has enhanced and redefined what it means to be a marketer. Utilizing social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, Dr. Coker intends for students to gain experience with digital publishing and development media platforms for the use of promotional campaigns. Through the use of these tools, not only are students learning technical skills needed within the business world, but they're also gaining valuable insight in their development of professional and their professional and personal brands for each student. Our next nominee is Eric Shoemaker from Communication Studies. Mr. Shoemaker is serving in his role as both a lab administrator and instructor. He has incorporated the use of technology into all of his courses. Now, along with his students learning theory, Mr. Shoemaker also implements message design, media aesthetics, audience analysis, and efficient workflow to help his students develop cross-platform media skills. Changing the dynamic of schoolwork, Mr. Shoemaker has replaced <clears throat> traditional essays with the creation of short films, documentaries, and the use of Premiere Pro. To facilitate the learning process, Mr. Shoemaker consistently uses new and emerging technologies in his class. Our next nominee is Malgrzat Rimjap Vlaska from History. Dr. Rimjap Vlaska consistently works with CATS to give students training in her courses that she feels are necessary for their edification. Hence, students are encouraged to use programs such as InDesign and Photoshop for designing exhibition labels and elements in iMovie and Audacity for creating audiovisual components. WordPress and Twitter are also used for blogging and publishing, as well as Dreamweebler and Weebly for students creating websites and web design. Now, through the use of these tools, students are able to develop digital media skills that not only future their academic endeavors, but also they get the opportunity to apply these skills in the execution of exhibitions that is the main feature of her history courses. So at this time, I'd like John to come up, and I don't believe that our award nominee is, or our winner is here. So we'll just show the plaque to all of you. It's a nice plaque. I picked it up yesterday. And this year's award winner is Dr. Patricia Belleville from Art. So you can give her a round of applause, even though she's not here. And to give Dr. Belleville some credit, she is the first individual in the state of Illinois who developed an art education program strictly online. So that is a, a great accomplishment for our university as well for Dr. Belleville. So I would like to thank everyone for coming. Um, it has been a pleasure. And now next year's award ceremony is going to be a little different. We're going to be doing it in conjunction with the uh, Publishing Scholars ceremony. So it'll actually be in October, but same, same great place, same great time. I think they have wine at that one, so it's always a good time. So thank you all for coming. Uh, no wine. <laughs>